The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for waiting. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, Happy New Year, first of all, and thank you so much for joining us on um, this really important webinar uh, on fair housing protections relating to people with disabilities. So I'm Pip Marks, and I'm the Project Director for Family Voices of California, and will be hosting today's webinar. And before I introduce our wonderful speaker, Naomi, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about um, Family Voices of California and what we do. So we're a statewide coalition of locally based uh, parent run centers working to ensure that children and youth with special health care needs receive quality uh, health care. And as the state affiliate of the National Family Voices, uh, we are California's federally funded Family to Family Health Information Center and provide statewide support and resources to families with special needs. So our um, webinars are statewide trainings on various disability related topics and are geared towards uh, really diverse uh, groups of people, families, professionals, parent to parent resource staff, um, etc. And if you have any uh, t technical difficulties like we just had during today's webinar, you can always go to that number on you see on the screen um, and just call them directly. And due to feedback issues, we have everybody on mute from our end. But there will be time uh, during throughout the webinar and at the end to ask questions. So just type your questions in the little right hand side question pane. What else? Oh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website in a couple of days. So if you miss any of this um, or want to get a copy of the slides, you can do that by visiting our website. It is now my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker, Naomi Sultan. Naomi is the supervising attorney for mental health advocacy services and I would like to just tell you a little bit about Naomi. She is which she leads the housing law program at MHAS, um, including the Fair Housing Initiatives Program, and represents medical, legal, community partnership clients in housing discrimination matters. Naomi has worked as a teacher for children with learning disabilities before embarking on a legal career. And upon graduating law school in 2015, Naomi was awarded a Skadden Fellowship to launch a medical legal partnership re representing homeless and unstably, unstably housed veterans and their families. In addition to her work at MHAS, Naomi also serves as an elected commissioner of the Santa Monica Rent Control Board. So Naomi, thank you so much for joining us. I am now going to sh change the screen over to you and it's all yours, so take it away. Great, thank you so much Pip, um, for that introduction. And um, thank you to Family Voices of California for the opportunity to provide this training. Um, hello to everybody out there. Um, I, you know, given the housing crisis in California, we understand that there's a lot of, and nationally, frankly, we understand there's a lot of interest in strategies to access and retain, particularly affordable housing. Not so no, we hope to be able no, oh, can people hear me? Yes, but we can't see your screen. So you should have had uh, a little okay. uh, text box come up saying share my screen. Is it or, full now? Uh, yes, thank you. Great. Uh, no. You're all set. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, there's a lot of interest in affordable housing and strategies to maintain affordable housing um, because of the housing crisis we're faced. Um, within this country. And so through this webinar, I hope to offer some insight into the legal protections that are out there for people with disabilities and their families in the housing arena. Um, we at MHAS Mental Health Advocacy Services are eager to share our knowledge and experience, um, but we understand that there's a lot of folks on this call that may have different experiences, similar experiences, advocates, family members. Um, and I hope as much as the kind of virtual um, process allows that will it be able to be a back and forth and there'll be time throughout the um, presentation for comments and questions. We'll stop periodically and do that. Um, we definitely don't have the answers to all of the sometimes difficult conundrums and scenarios that come up in this context. So I'm hoping this can be as much as possible sort of a, a collaborative 
discussion um, and that we can benefit from each other's wisdom and expertise. So, there we go, okay. Um, so, this webinar is going to focus particularly on um, fair housing law as it impacts um, and protects people with disabilities. Um, but, you know, like people of color and other marginalized groups, Folks with disabilities have historically faced rampant discrimination in all aspects of society, including housing, employment, healthcare, public services. So to address disability discrimination, Congress enacted several federal laws, including the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, um, and also the Fair Housing Act, um, to prohibit discrimination. Um, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination not only against people with disabilities, but also based on race, color, sex, um, national origin, and family status. In California, we have some wonderful laws that provide even greater protections to people with disabilities. In California, we, say, we consider the federal law um, a floor, not a ceiling, and so California law expands upon the um, protections offered under federal fair housing and anti-discrimination laws. Um, in addition to the uh, categories I mentioned previously, it also prohibits discrimination based on marital status, ancestry, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, um, genetic and, and source of income which now actually includes um, Section 8 vouchers and other types of housing subsidies. So landlords in California can't have a policy to not accept uh, tenants that need housing subsidies, any type of local, state, federal housing subsidy. Um, there's also, as of this year, this is an exciting time to present this webinar, there's new um, regulations under the Fair Employment and Housing Act, new housing regulations that have a lot of really great language, um, particularly around reasonable accommodations, um, reasonable accommodations during the eviction process, um, some other stuff that, that we'll get into later, but I wanted to mention that at the outset, um, at, at, excuse me, at the beginning. And I also wanted to reference, um, I hope we'll have a little bit of time to get into this later as well, um, some other, new laws um, in California that protect all tenants. Um, you know, tenants with disabilities or, or, you know, folks with disabilities tend to, because of uh, discrimination, as I mentioned before, in employment, and maybe they're not able to work at all, are more likely to be low income. So laws that protect, uh, provide all sorts of eviction protections, um, for tenants um, can be particularly useful for vulnerable uh, tenants with disability, disabilities. So there's a new state law called AB 1482 or the Tenant Protection Act, um, which provides a, a rent cap statewide um, and also uh, just cause eviction protection, meaning that landlords can no longer anywhere in California issue 60-day um, notices 30-day notices without any reason. They have to give one of the reasons enumerated in the law. Um, and also, um, like as I mentioned, there's a rent cap, which is gonna be no more than 10%. This year it's 8.3%. Um, Something else to mention, there's a lot of jurisdictions in California, an increasing number with their own rent control ordinances, which tend to be even more protective of tenants than the new state law I mentioned. And um, those local ordinances are not preempted by the state law. So any local ordinance that's more protective is still in place. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, of new ones out there in California as well. So as I mentioned, um, fair housing laws in California protect these additional categories on the right in blue. Um, the ones on the left are, which are race, religion, national origin, color, sex, 
physical and mental disabilities and family status, those are all protected under the uh, federal law as well. Um, family status is an important one, um, and that includes um, family, excuse me, that includes families with kids under 18 or um, pregnant, uh, pregnant people. Um, and family status discrimination um, is something that comes up more than you would think. Like it's not just landlords refusing to rent to families uh, with children, but it can sometimes be discriminatory policies that um, different landlords would have around, you know, nobody can play out here at a certain time, signs you know, indicating certain areas are off limits for certain activities that children might be um, engaged in. Um, so that's something to be on the lookout for as well. Um, and of course, there's these additional categories I mentioned on the right. So um, nobody can against based on um, any of these categories in California. So as I said today, we're focusing on um, disability under fair housing law. And disability in California um, is actually interpreted quite broadly. So on the federal level, in order to be entitled to um, disability protections, you have to have a substantial limitation on the major life activity. In California, it's just a major la uh, limitation, excuse me, a limitation on a major life activity. That limitation doesn't have to be substantial. And major life activities are a lot of different things. Walking, reading, eating, breathing, thinking, communicating. Anything that can be an important part of a human life basically constitutes a major life activity. And if a person is limited in performing that activity because of a disability, um, then they are considered disabled and, disabled and entitled to the protections of uh, fair housing laws in California. Something interesting to note is that um, alcoholism, current alcoholism is actually considered a disability as well as past alcoholism. Current illegal drug use is not a disability, but past drug use is considered a disability. So if somebody formerly had an illegal drug use problem um, and because of that, they are currently um, in need of a, an accommodation, um, they might be entitled to that accommodation based only on that um, status as a former illegal drug user. Um, but again, current alcoholism is considered um, an addiction. Disability also includes the record or history of having a disability. Um, so if somebody previously had a disability or is misclassified as having a disability or even perceived to have a disability, such folks wouldn't need an accommodation because they don't actually have a disability um, unless there are, you know, sort of lasting effects in the previous from the having of the disability. But someone would say a perceived disability um, would need an accommodation, but they can't be discriminated against. So if somebody thinks, um, you know, for example, all veterans have PTSD and they don't want to rent to, to a veteran or they think a particular veteran has you know, must have a disability because they were a military veteran. Um, you can't, they can't discriminate against them based on that perceived disability. That would be illegal um, disability discrimination under the California uh, Fair Employment and Housing Act. I also wanted to note, I saw a couple of questions that came in when folks registered. Um, and one of the questions was, is disability limited to certain diagnoses? Um, no, it is not. So as long as um, you, due to a disability, have a limitation of a major life activity, it doesn't really matter what your diagnosis is. Um, another question was, does a person need to enroll in some program to qualify for protections of fair housing laws? Um, and no, they don't. Um, sometimes it can be helpful, and we'll get into this later, about 
how you might in some situations need to verify disability or need for an accommodation. And in those situations, it can be useful to be in a program where somebody knows of your disability and is providing support so they can provide that verification if needed. But you are in no way required to be in treatment for the disability or in some sort of program in order to be um, entitled to the protections of, of fair housing laws. Um, I thought because there were originally some questions about the definition of disability, this might be a good opportunity to see if any additional questions have arisen or comments. I'm not seeing any, Naomi, at this point. Okay, great. Well, please um, be sure to uh, type those in so that Pip can uh, have those questions and comments um, when we, you know, when we stop. So I want to make sure I'm addressing the, the concerns and questions that folks have out there. So what does the fair in fair housing mean? Um, typically, when we think of fair housing, um, we think everybody should be treated the same. That's fair, right? So you can't say, oh, I don't rent to people, to black people, I don't rent to Muslims, I don't rent to women, I don't rent to lesbians, because that's not fair. Everybody should be treated the same. But when it comes to people with mental and physical disabilities, we certainly don't want that kind of overt discrimination that I just mentioned. So you can't say I don't rent to veterans because they have PTSD or other folks with disabilities. I might use a lot of veteran examples because as Pip mentioned, I uh, have a lot of experience working with veterans. But there's an additional way that housing needs to be fair. Um, for people with mental and physical disabilities. And it's not about treating people the same. It's actually about treating people different. So um, if somebody, this is, is kind of a, a, a simple example, but let's say there's somebody who uses a wheelchair and there's stairs to get into the apartment building that they want to rent. Now, yeah, everybody is treated the same, right? Everybody has to go up the stairs. But that doesn't end up being fair for the person with the disability. If the person with a disability isn't offered a, a reasonable modification, if they're not offered some type of different treatment, then they won't be able to access the building the way that everybody else can. So for folks with mental and physical disabilities, sometimes it might be necessary to make changes to the way to treat people differently in order to enable them to live in and enjoy their housing. I hope that makes sense and I hope you'll tell me later if uh, you have questions about that. So when, when is a landlord unlawfully discriminating? As I mentioned before, some discrimination is intentional and obvious. I don't rent to people in wheelchairs. We don't want weirdos here when they're probably talking about people with mental health. Disabilities. Um, sometimes there are policies that have a disparate impact on people with disabilities because they effectively make an opportunity less accessible to those folks. So if you say no animals allowed, folks that need service animals or assistive animals would feel deterred from applying to that particular housing complex because uh, they think that they won't be accommodated or a policy that says to apply, you have to visit the office. Um, some people don't, aren't able to go to certain places either due to physical accessibility issues or perhaps somebody has uh, agoraphobia and can't visit the office themselves, need uh, a representative to visit the office for them. Um, so policies like that can have a disparate impact on people with disabilities and end up making housing less accessible to them. Another form of disability discrimination is denial of a reasonable accommodation. And that is actually um, probably the most common form of disability discrimination. I understand that the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing is seeing now is failure to provide accommodations when necessary for people with disability. And that is also a violation of the law. So 
A reasonable accommodation, as I alluded to before, is a change in the rules necessary to help a person with a disability access housing or housing related services. So um, a common example that we see is there's a building that has a no pets policy, but there's a person that needs, let's say in this situation, the type of assistive animal that they need is an emotional support animal. So they don't need a service animal, a service animal being an animal that um, is trained to perform a specific task. This person needs an emotional support animal that provides them emotional support, which helps alleviate the effects of their disability. So that's a common uh, reasonable accommodation request that folks are making these days. Even though your building is no pets, um, I need to move in here with my um, assistive animal, which is my emotional support animal, um, in order to be able to benefit from and enjoy this housing. People often make that accommodation request before they're in housing. You can make an accommodation request while you're in housing. Um, that's an example of a common reasonable accommodation request. I'll try to get into more later and hopefully you'll be able to add some. So landlords, um, and it's not just landlords as well. We mostly deal with tenants, but this also applies um, in all housing contexts. So uh, lenders, realtors, anybody involved in the sale or rental of housing is required to make accommodations. Um, but they're only required to make reasonable accommodations, not any accommodation, not just any change. So the question is, what makes an accommodation reasonable? And the answer to that is it's reasonable if it's necessary due to the disability, it provides the disabled person with equal access to housing, and it is not an undue burden, fundamental alteration, or direct threat. I would also add to that, um, we don't have it in the slide, but also likely to create substantial damage. That's another exception. These are the only ways that landlords can deny accommodations um, that are necessary is if they're an undue burden, um, meaning uh, too expensive for the landlord usually. Uh, fundamental alteration means it would require the landlord or the lender or the housing provider to do something that's not part of their normal practice. Um, direct threat and as I mentioned before, substantial property damage often come up in the context of, um, again, like assistive animals. Um, we often get calls from clients who have service animals or support animals who are breeds that people tend to be afraid of, um, like pit bulls or something similar. Um, and landlords can only reject, you can't just, landlords can't just have a policy to reject a particular breed, it has to be, um, based on what they know about that particular animal, that that particular animal based on the individual circumstances of that animal, what it's been known to do, what it's done, has actually directly threatened um, people or uh, directly threatened the, um, the conditions of, of the building to cause substantial damage to the building. Um, Naomi? Naomi, yeah. there's, there's been quite a few questions that have come in about um, reasonable accommodation. Can you take a few questions now? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me just go to the, to make a reasonable accommodation, would the person or family then need to disclose their disability and provide proof and or provide proof? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to get into that a bit more, okay. but you will need to, to disclose that you have a disability. And also you have to explain to the landlord that the accommodation is necessary because of the disability. Okay. So um, often you have to disclose enough about the disability for, for the housing provider to understand why the disability necessitates the accommodation. But okay. no medical records are needed, et cetera. And I'll get into that a bit more. Okay. And then another one regarding the same um, topic. In regards to emotional support, uh, to the emotional support animal, do you have to disclose this while applying? Because that person says, I feel like if I do, then they, they, they won't choose you for the housing. Right, right. No, that's like a common question that we get. 
Um, you don't have to. I mean, you could, uh, you're entitled to the accommodation, um, I would argue, either way, as long as you need that animal in your housing with you. Sometimes it can be a good idea to disclose up front insofar as that might help create a better um, relationship with the landlord going forward. Um, but, you know, if, if there is a fear that the landlord will use that as a pretext to, first of all, if, if, a, if you disclose that you have an emotional support animal um, and at that point the landlord or the housing provider refuses to provide you the housing, you can certainly file a fair housing complaint at that point because that's discrimination. Um, but um, it, it's kind of a judgment call in that situation as to, you know, sort of practically as to when to disclose it. I've had clients um, do it both ways. Okay. There are more questions, but not related to um, reasonable, so we, I can ask those at the end. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to get a little bit more into what is it that makes an accommodation necessary. Um, and in order to understand if a reasonable accommodation is necessary, you have to ask yourself, is there a connection between the accommodation requested and the disability? So for example, um, can a tenant use a side door for entry because the tenant's disability makes contact with people frightening? So let's say there's a tenant with a mental health disability that has some anxiety around you know, people. Uh, but there's a side door they can use. It's not normally accessible to tenants. Um, you know, in the absence of other uh, information, that sounds like a perfectly acceptable um, accommodation that a landlord would be required to provide because there is that connection between the disability, the symptoms of the disability, the anxiety, and the need to use the more secluded side door. Um, so this is an example of when there isn't a connection. Can a tenant use a side gate because the main gate is inconvenient and the tenant happens to have depression? Um, not really seeing the connection there between the depression and you know, the need to use the side gate. So in that case, um, it would probably not be necessary to use a disability and the landlord would not be required to grant that. Um, I wanted to give a few more examples of accommodations that might be necessary. Um, I mentioned before that there's new fair housing regulations that just went into effect um, earlier, you know, January 1st. Um, and one of the great things about the new fair housing regulations is they have a lot of um, good examples. And one of the examples they give of accommodations is financial accommodations. So accommodations don't necessarily, even though there has to be that connection, it doesn't have to be um, that the accommodation is limited to the immediate effects of the disability. It could also address the practical needs caused by the disability. So for example, um, somebody is um, fully disabled, can't work, lives on SSI, and doesn't get their rent check on the first, excuse me, doesn't get their disability check on the first of the month. They get it later in the month. Um, so the reasonable accommodation request would be to pay, pay rent, um, or it could be pay their mortgage, um, at, you know, like on the 7th or the 14th or wherever it is that is um, that works given when they receive their disability check. So even though there's a little bit of a, um, there's a couple of steps between the disability and the need to pay rent later on in the month. Um, those types of accommodations, as long, it, it's a, and a practical effect of the disability is that they need to live on um, their disability check, which comes later in the month. Another example is um, like a co-signer for somebody that due to their disability can't afford um, their rent on their own or doesn't qualify as, as having enough income on their own. Um, a practical effect of the disability for a lot of people, for a lot of disabilities, is lower income than folks that are able to work. And accommodations um, that account for that um, may be necessary for a lot of folks. Um, there's a lot of great examples in the new fair housing regulations in California, which I encourage folks to take a look at. I wanted to find the actual site. 
Yes, a California Code of Regulations, the reasonable accommodation section starts at Cal Code of Regulations section 12176. Um, and if you look in that section, there's a lot of great um, examples around um, accommodation. So I mentioned before that there's only a couple of ways that a housing provider can deny an accommodation. Um, one is if they're able to say, hey, there's no connection between what you're asking for, the accommodation you're asking for and your disability. Another one is if um, it's an undue burden. So an example, and that's usually if it's too difficult or expensive. The example we have here is, um, let's say a tenant who has like a hoarding problem. Um, hoarding problems are often due to a mental health disability, some, you know, inability, like depression, anxiety, inability to clean, kind of face your mountain of stuff. Um, some folks even think that hoarding is its own disability. But in any case, you know, depending on the extent of the hoarding, that could end up being um, dangerous, right? Because it, it could expose um, that tenant and the whole building to like a fire hazard, even like risk of the building collapsing. So a landlord would probably not be required to permit a tenant with a disability to have an, to maintain an extreme hoarding situation because it would be an undue burden. It exposes them to um, financial and legal liability. Um, on the other hand, a reasonable accommodation that they would likely be required to grant is, let's say that the tenant um, who has a hoarding problem was cited for, you know, by the city by the fire department, or let's say the landlord gave them, you know, a notice to clean up, a three-day notice, um, and they need more time, right? They need more time to get some additional mental health services, to find an agency that can help them clean up. Um, all of that would probably be uh, a reasonable accommodation that the landlord would be required to grant, but just letting the hoarding situation, the extreme hoarding situation sort of play itself out would not likely be. Um, Fundamental alteration, if a landlord or a housing provider can argue that the accommodation fundamentally changes the nature of their program, then it might uh, not be something they're required to grant. Um, so an example here that we've given, a landlord can't be expected to walk or feed an emotional support animal. Um, that's not part of what they do. Um, unless, of course, you know, this is a subsidized housing provider that provides a lot of services, including dog walking or animal feeding, and then, of course, they would have to do it. But something outside the sort of scope of what that landlord normally provides um, is typically considered a, a fundamental alteration and therefore would not be um, required as an accommodation. Um, I also mentioned the direct threat. Uh, exception. So accommodations cannot be a direct threat to the health or safety of others or result in physical damage to the property. Um, as I also mentioned before, this can't be based um, just on, say when we're talking about a support animal, an assistive animal can't be based on just like the breed, the reputation of that dog. Um, or we often, you know, see cases with folks um, with mental disabilities, with developmental disabilities, who might make a threatening remark to someone, they might be yelling out in the hallway, they might even have something that can be construed as a weapon that they might be brandishing. Um, but as long as they're not actually likely to cause bodily harm to someone, serious bodily harm, and even if they are, if there's an accommodation that would mitigate that direct threat, say additional services that this person could get that would prevent this kind of behavior in the future, um, then the landlord can't use that direct threat exception to get out of the accommodation, granting the accommodation. The direct threat exception is intended to be um, very limited and only apply in situations where you have a person or an animal who is really a serious imminent threat um, to, to other people's bodily integrity and, and property. So I would encourage these, these cases can be quite uh, sort of difficult and fraught and at any type of situation where somebody is struggling um, to get an accommodation granted, they definitely want to reach out to 
their local fair housing council, their local um, legal aid, uh, local disability rights attorney, if they can afford to pay an attorney, um, particularly in these situations, um, like where there's an allegation of direct threat, um, attorneys can be useful because again, that um, exception is intended uh, to be very limited. I want to talk now a little bit about the interactive process. Um, and that's the process that landlords and any type of housing provider is required to go through when a um, tenant or a person with a disability or a person who's requesting accommodation on behalf of a person with disability, when they ask for that, um, landlords are required to go through this interactive process to determine if that this accommodation meets their needs and is appropriate, doesn't qualify for one of those exceptions I met or if the, I just mentioned, or if there's some other accommodation. And again, the new for housing regulations have a lot of good language on interactive process. Um, if the landlord says, hey, you know, this, this accommodation that you are requesting um, is too much of a burden, right? It's an undue burden. So um, an example I would give would be, um, let's say there's a tenant who has um, mobility limitations and so can't leave their apartment to take out the trash, right? And so the accommodation they requested is I want the you know, landlord or somebody who works for the landlord to come pick up my trash every day. Um, you know, that might be an undue burden or a fundamental alteration um, to have the landlord do something that they're not doing for other tenants. Um, and that's not part of their typical landlording duties. Um, if there's a maintenance person on the property a couple days a week, um, maybe it would be reasonable to have that maintenance person, you know, come to the door and pick up the garbage a couple days a week. Or maybe they could give a, um, you know, a key to, um, like, let's say there's a, a key that needs to be used to access the garbage area, and that key could be given to, um, a person that's like an IHSS worker or a person that's assisting the person um, with the physical disability that can't leave the apartment um, without difficulty. So these are the types of things that, that are supposed to be worked out during the interactive process, meaning the landlord can't just say, no, you know, you're, the, what you asked for is unreasonable, end of story. They have to work with, find an alternative accommodation that might um, address, address your needs. Um, and they are absolutely required to engage in this process. Um, they, part of the interactive process is also getting more information. So let's say the land, you request um, an accommodation, um, but the landlord or the housing provider doesn't think that they have enough information about the disability or the connection between the disability and the accommodation. They can't just say, no, you don't get it because I don't have that information they have to first request more information, more inf excuse me, more information. Um, and as I mentioned before, if the landlord believes that whatever accommodation you're requesting is unreasonable for whatever reason, they have to consider whether there's an alternative accommodation that would also meet your needs. All right, let me get into, um, this sort of addresses some of the questions that came up earlier around the reasonable accommodation request process. Um, the first step in getting an accommodation is to request the accommodation. Now, it doesn't have to be the tenant or the person with a disability. It could be somebody requesting it on their behalf. Um, it also doesn't have to, there's, there's no magic words that are required to request an accommodation. You don't even actually have to say the words reasonable accommodation. Um, it can help though. It can help so that the landlord knows what you're asking for and so that they understand um, that fair housing and anti-discrimination laws are at play. But really, um, any, any time that a person um, makes clear that they have a disability and they need a change um, in a housing practice, because of that, that, that counts as a request for accommodation, be it um, you know, verbal or written. Um, we tend to recommend that clients, um, that folks make reasonable accommodation requests in writing so that they have proof that they made that request in case they need to file a complaint if the landlord denies it. That's generally considered a best, a best practice. Um, 
we see sometimes that particularly housing authorities and large housing providers will say you have to fill out this particular form, follow this particular procedure. Um, that's not actually required. It can be sort of helpful just in terms of moving the process along if you are able to complete that form or follow that procedure. Um, you know, to, to do that, just to sort of, like I said, move the process along, but that's absolutely not required. And if a housing provider is demanding that you fill out a particular form, follow a particular process, um, that's unlawful and you could file a complaint based on that. This is really important. If the disability is obvious, the housing provider can't demand verification of the disability. You'd be surprised how many times, or maybe not, depending on your experience, how many times housing providers are very familiar that a person has a disability. So the person you know, has paraplegia, they're in a wheelchair, they use crutches, um, or the person is in you know, some type of supported housing, which is only for people with mental health disabilities, and still they're demanding proof of disability. That's not okay. If the disability is obvious or if it's known to the housing provider, they can't require proof of disability. If the housing provider already has somebody's you know, proof of disability income, they know they're disabled. Um, end of story. Um, sometimes the disability will be clear, um, but maybe the connection between the accommodation and the disability isn't necessarily clear. This is particularly the case um, when we're talking about accommodations for non-physical disabilities, for mental health disabilities, for developmental disabilities. Usually it's obvious why the person in the wheelchair needs a ramp, but it might not be obvious um, why the person with a mental health disability needs an emotional support animal. Um, and in that case, they can ask for um, an explanation of connection between the disability and the need for the accommodation. Um, but they can't demand medical records, diagnoses, or independent evaluations. Um, that's, that's something important to note. Um, tenants can also request multiple accommodations. So the tenant who needs to pay their rent on the 14th, because that's after they get their disability check, um, can request another accommodation um, for whatever other disability related, um, let's say they need a, a roommate as um, due to the low income. Um, and that's related to their disability. They can also ask for that. There's no limit on the number of accommodations that folks can ask for, and landlords have to consider each one. Um, another important thing to remember is that tenants um, can request accommodations at any time. So when they're applying for housing w during their tenancy, or even during the eviction process, at least until they're actually locked out of the building um, or move out of the building. Um, accommodations can be requested. So there's a question, Naomi, about that. Someone was asking, but do, when applying for housing, do you have to um, ask at that time, notify them at that time that you need accommodation or can you wait until you're in the building and then ask for it? so that mm -hmm. yeah i mean you could absolutely wait until the building until you're in the building because i understand that there's a fear of um a fear that people will be unlawfully discriminated against right. based on their status as a person with a disability okay. sometimes people need um accommodations during the application process so let's say you can't go in person to apply or you need that co-signer um, or there, there's a variety of different reasons why somebody might ask an accommodation um, before they're actually in the housing. Um, but um, you can absolutely request an accommodation once you're housed at any step. Okay, thank you. Okay. So this is something else that often comes up um, as to who can verify disability or need for accommodation. Um, it is a, a common perception that only doctors can verify um, 
that somebody needs an accommodation. And that is typically not the case. Um, um, quote, there's a quote here from a, um, a joint statement on reasonable accommodations from HUD and also the Department of Justice. Um, and this is really echoed in the new fair housing reg, um, indicating that typically the person with the disability themselves um, can often provide all the verification that's needed. And that can be through different self-certification methods. As I mentioned before, you know, providing proof that you receive disability benefits, a letter from Social Security Administration should be sufficient in most cases. Um, or even a credible statement by the individual themselves. Um, if there's no reason to doubt that person's credibility as to their disability, that itself should be sufficient. Um, a doctor, medical professional, a peer support group, a non-medical service agency, or a reliable third party in a position to know about the disability may also provide verification um, of disability or need for accommodation. So that could include, like it says, somebody in a support group, um, a therapist, a, um, any type of social service provider who knows about the disability, a family member who knows about the disability, as long as it's credible and that person in a, is in a position to know about the disability or need for accommodation, whatever it is that they're verifying, that should be sufficient. If you believe that you've provided sufficient verification of disability and need for accommodation and the landlord is saying enough, um, you know, I need more, this isn't acceptable, you can absolutely file a complaint with HUD or in California with the um, Department of Fair Employment and Housing. I mentioned before reasonable modification. That's when you're talking about a physical change to a building that's needed in order for a person with a disability to access or use the housing. Um, the most common example of that is a ramp. Um, typically, and there's other um, reasonable modifications. Uh, for example, sometimes folks uh, with mental health disabilities or um, developmental disabilities might need soundproofing um, in their apartments because the symptom of the disability, one of the symptoms is the disability can an elevated noise level um, that could potentially disturb other tenants. So a potential modification could be um, soundproofing. Um, typically, when we're talking about modification, the tenant, the tenant's family is required to pay for that modification and also pay to uninstall it um, unless the building receives uh, federal subsidies, federal housing subsidies. In that case, usually um, the landlord would have to pay for that modification and the uninstalling of that modification would that they choose to do so. And the analysis for reasonable modifications is generally the same um, for accommodations. As I mentioned before, um, when talking about animal breeds or people with disability, mental health disabilities, uh, decisions can't be made on in terms of denying or granting accommodations. Um, based on stereotypes. It has to be based on like actual facts about the actual person, actual animal. And another important thing to note is that confidentiality um, is required with reasonable accommodation requests. So landlords, housing providers can't go around telling other tenants um, that this person has a disability and that's why they need the dog and you know, disclosing anything. Anything um, provided during the accommodation request process the accommodation provision process is considered um, confidential and landlords could be liable, housing providers could be liable for disclosing that information to tenants and folks that don't have a need to know it. So here I list the, um, some of the ways that you can file a complaint if you believe that you or a family member has been discriminated against based on disability or one of those other categories I mentioned at the outset. Um, HUD uh, takes discrimination complaints, um, also the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing 
Um, if you go to those websites, you can typically file a complaint online. You can also call in and file a complaint. Um, you can also snail mail a complaint should you choose to do so. Um, and the great thing, um, you can also file a complaint depending on where you are with the Housing Rights Council um, in your local area, the Housing Rights Agency. So in LA, uh, Los Angeles, you have Housing Rights Center, and I've listed a couple of the numbers for them. Um, the great thing about Housing Rights Center, DFEH, um, they will actually, you know, depending on the type of allegation of discrimination you're making, go out and investigate and get all the materials um, and really do a whole investigation process to determine if uh, discrimination has taken place. Um, so I would highly recommend that, that folks do that um, if they uh, are encountering denial of reasonable accommodations or other types of discrimination. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, yes, there are some, Naomi. Actually, just going back to, uh, somebody was asking, are these new regulations that you've been talking about, are they, um, are they from the, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing or Department of Housing Urban Development? These, yeah, these no, these are California are regulations okay. that, are, um, that are interpreting the Fair Employment and Housing Act um, and that, that are um, enforced by the Department of fair employment and housing. Okay. So, it, yeah, if you go on the um, DFEH, was the Department of Fair Employment and Housing website, they should have hopefully updated it to include those regulations, um, which they now enforce. And you can also, like I said, if you look at the California Code of Regulations, section 12176, um, and subsequently, you will find. Um, the, the new regulations as they relate to reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities. Great. Um, somebody's asking, does an emotional support animal have to be certified like other service animals? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So actually, there's no certification that's required for either type of animal. So service animals don't require some specific certification, and emotional support animals don't require certification. Um, the only thing that a service animal has to do, it has to be trained to do um, a specific task to help the person with disabilities. And it can be trained by an organization, and maybe that's how you got the certification, or it can be trained by the person um, with disabilities themselves. So I have a client who um, trained her dog to, like, recognize, she herself trained her dog to recognize when she's, like, about to have a seizure. Um, and so that dog is now considered a service animal. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of shysters on the internet trying to force people to pay for different certifications, particularly for emotional support animals. And often those are not valid because the person who granted the certification doesn't know, hasn't really spoken with, isn't really aware of the disability of the person needing the emotional support animal or the animal itself. Okay. Um, so, so I would encourage that, that need an emotional support animal. It can be good to get if you have a therapist or any type of um, person in a position to be aware of the type of support that animal provides to, to provide a letter um, stating that, that the animal is necessary to help with the effects of the disability. Thanks for that. Now, we've only got one minute left, so Naomi, you said kindly that you would accept. So there's several more questions that we don't have time for, but I'm going to email them to you, and then if you could um, try and answer them, and I can make sure that they get out to the um, webinar attendees. Uh, that's still okay for you? Yeah, that sounds okay. great. Um, folks are also encouraged to contact my office if they have um, additional questions. Um, and I've put here our, um, our website and also our phone number where we um, do intakes with folks um, that have concerns around um, housing discrimination and all other types of Fantastic. And I just want to remind everybody that after the webinar, you're going to, everybody's going to get a short, very short evaluation survey to fill out, and we really, really need your feedback. It's, it's truly invaluable, um, and it's really important for us to report that to our funders, um, for Naomi to, as well. So if you could please just take 
probably one minute to fill out the survey that you're going to receive. Uh, we would appreciate that. Um, so, Naomi, thank you so much. This has been really valuable information. Um, and we should do this again. <laughs> thanks. Yes, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Have a, have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye.